Hi, I'm Dan Russell, and I'm here to talk to you today about the HCI of art this year, or maybe at this millisecond, because we live in a really interesting time. And I scarcely know where to begin with this topic, because as you know, all of a sudden there's been this huge explosion, this efflorescence of AI and machine learning systems that are supporting people doing art because you've seen what's happening, right? People are creating images that capture worlds, that capture interesting ideas that we couldn't have thought about before. A stained glass fox standing in a field or an open plain with storm clouds on a bright yellow green horizon. All of a sudden we have these systems that are supporting our creativity, creating our artwork for us in an interesting way so the question really is if our systems can do this where does the human come in how can we build the user experience of these systems in such a way that we can control them that we can manipulate them that we can do what we want because look i will have to tell you this i don't know where all this is going we are in a fascinating time in a fascinating space but let's explore what these options are for us going forward and for the field. There are many, many things we could talk about. This is just a partial list, and I'm going to touch on each of these today a little bit about how we can modify sounds to achieve our artistic goals, how we can generate images, how we can generate videos, we can generate 3D models. You see where this is going? We can generate mm, a lot of different kinds of things, up to and including avatars that do our bidding for us along with GPT and BARD style text generation. Creation of artwork, creation of ideas, fascinating time. Let's first talk about musical sound modification. And I want to talk about this basic observation that technology has always transformed the music industry. It's It's been true since day one. You probably don't remember when recorded music first came into the scene, but that was a huge shift for the musicians of the world. As new technologies for music making came online, changed the sound of everything we heard. Saxophones, for example, invented by Adolf Sax, they were a new technology once upon a time. And he, one man, radically changed the sound of jazz forever. So one approach to thinking about how to do AI ML systems in music is to think about how you can use machine learning to modify the way sound gets generated. And so there's this project at Google called Tone Transfer. The basic idea is you can take in a sound of some form, say the human voice or some instrument, and then transform it through a kind of machine learning filtering process to whatever sound you'd like. What would that be like? This is interesting because it's kind of one aspect of how artificial intelligence is transforming the music industry. We know we have AI support for composition because when you play and it's automatically transcribed, there's an AI system in the background there listening and trying to figure out what the right notes are, what the rhythms are, and so on. We see AI in the assisting performance because all of a sudden now, if you're performing something from score, you can get AI music to support the rendering of that. And of course, we're gonna be talking about sound processing. So within the Google Music world, there's a project called Magenta, and it's a collection of different kinds of creative aspects of ways of transforming sound or doing composition. So for example, they've got this N-Synth system where they use audio synthesis to create new kinds of sounds, do transfer, I'll show you that in a second. They also have a system called AI Duet, which is in kind of an experimental way to do neural network based duet playing. You play, it responds, you perhaps you play together. The deeper point I wanna make here is that we're entering a new realm of interaction. This is going to be, this whole area is going to be where all the interesting work in HCI is going to be in the next few years. It's important to recognize that Music is not just influenced by technology, but also by culture. So the sounds we make, the kinds of opportunities available to us are a function of the music itself, the background, the history, the culture, and the technology. 
Here we see a man in South Africa playing an accordion, a concertina in particular, which came to South Africa as a traditional European instrument. But the Zulu culture rejiggered the instrument, not with AI, but with wires and wire cutters and pliers, but they reconfigured the technology to suit their culture. And that's what we're seeing with music exploration now. How does AI allow us to explore the boundaries of our culture, the boundaries of our music? One way to think about this is how might we enable new kinds of music making using AI technology and honoring the culture? Well, one way to do this is to use this magenta-based, this magenta project's tone transfer systems. The idea is you train an ML model on music recordings. You then provide some musical input, like your voice or an instrument you're playing. And then you transfer the model's audio style onto the actual music that you've made. We're going to see the same thing come up again and again where a model then imputes a particular kind of style onto, in this case, the audio track. We'll see it in the next section on visual Im images. But think about it. We can take stylistic information, encode it in a model, and then use it to apply on top of existing material. This is trickier and more important than it might sound. It's not just putting a layer of light pink varnish on the outside of an image. It's actually going in and substantially affecting the process of creation itself. So I've just talked about the tone transfer idea. And yes, we can use it as a filter, but there's other things we can do. And the challenge for, for all of us in design here is how can we change the original process and make it better and make it more flexible and more responsive to you as a human? That is the fundamental HCI challenge in a lot of this work, is how can we build systems that allow us to behave, create, express ourselves in ways that take advantage of the underlying AI and machine learning technology. So the tone transfer thing I mentioned to you is this sound guided, the sound modification guided by an AI model. So I can do a quick demo here, but the key idea is that we've got one source of information, which then is modified by the model itself. If you could have stayed. I think you see the thing. All of a sudden, the model captures the nuances of expression of the different instruments, be it flute, violin, trumpet, pots and pans, or chaotic singing. One of the nice things about these models is that they're exposable. You can view them. And so when you're actually using the tone transfer system, it's possible to open up and see what the training data was. And you can, of course, modify your own data, create your own instrument, and so on. This is really nice because it allows a musician without a lot of training in the depths of machine learning to import something that represents their expression of musical taste. So, of course, when we're thinking about user interface interaction, the default mechanisms of Western European culture are things like keyboards or reed instruments or brass instruments or whatever. But what if you could do something a little bit different? There are great opportunities in this space to explore more subtle, say, microtonal or more interesting kinds of interaction mechanisms. What would those be like? That's been, we've been talking about how people might modify audio signals to produce something kind of new. Let's talk for a second about synthesizing images because you've probably seen, and I showed you earlier, some of what people are doing. Now, I'm going to go back just a little bit in history because there is generic. <laughs> generative image synthesis, there was this notion that you could take a style. And so this is a paper from many years ago, but the neural art style paper from I think 2017, references there, basically showed how you could take an image 
identify a style image like uh, like uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night there on the right-hand side, and then extract the model of the style and apply it to the content image. And that's what you see in the bottom right. So taking the source, the style, and combining them together. So what the model is capturing is some essence of style. The swirls, the paint strokes, the color choices, all that stuff gets represented in this learned model. Now, this is interesting because this is sort of on the pathway to where we get to today with generative images. So once upon a time, there's a system at Google called Deep Dream, and it basically is your standard multi-layer neural architecture. And the idea is that you think about these recognizers or classifiers, you can imagine that the green node in the middle represents a particular dog, a particular kind of dog. But if you use this as a way of analyzing images, what you get are, again, taking the starry night image, you can start to see how under paradigms of training, it will start to hallucinate in these interstitial layers. It starts to see eyes in the image. And that's what's going on. So this is, in essence, a, a look inside the layer. And once people looked inside the layer and realized, oh, it's actually creating these images, well, these sort of doggy eye looking images out of sort of random noised whole cloth. Wait a second, maybe we can drive this forward and start using it to create new synthetic images. That was the key insight. So we go from art styles, and you can see here uh, Van Gogh's uh, wheat field with cypresses. I don't know why Van Gogh is so important in this, but he is. Um, and you start combining it with different kinds of background images, like say the Warhol, uh, Marilyn Monroe, and the going beyond just carrying the carrying the style information in the, in the machine learning model. One of the things we can start to do now is to extrapolate forward and do image synthesis by taking lots of images and then creating an image embedding, doing the same thing with text and then doing this mapping from the text input that is the prompt to synthesize an image using a process like stable diffusion. What that allows you to do from a human computer interaction perspective is give a text prompt, go through this process and then create an image like the one that's described by the text. So you've seen this before. It allows you to do things like this. The artist, Jason Allen, created this work, Teatro de Opera, Opera Spatial, and it took uh, an award at an art festival. And this opens up the, the can of worms about copyright, creativity, inventiveness. And he was very straightforward about it. So by, by the rules of the competition, he won. Um, and an interesting question now, where is creativity? What is art now in an age when somebody can do, do just text and create these wonderful images? This is an important point because a lot of the image synthesis systems now are driven by text prompts. So what we're seeing is a, a rise of prompt engineering. So what you see here in the teal color is the text that was used to generate the image on the right. Notice that there's some interesting things about it, like the emoticons, the term bomb explosion repeated multiple times. Is that necessary? I don't know. Um, and the addition of some named artists like Jose Daniel Cabrera Pena and Greg Gutowski. So you see what's going on here. <clears throat> They're appealing specifically to the art done by those people. It's not their art. It's sort of a, a melange of these different people's uh, visual influences. This is all done using the particular model and a seed number and this mysterious parameter CFG. So now to be a prompt engineer, that is to be someone effective using these tools, you need to know both what to create in the prompt and the kinds of additional parameters and which model to use. From a UI perspective, this is interesting because you don't think of these as normal components of a user experience. They're sort of like old fashioned things. But all of a sudden, what's old is new again. It's interesting then to also compare these different kinds of systems because each system has its own algorithm and its own training set, its own model. 
Those models then create substantial differences in the kinds of images that are put out. So stable diffusion creates one particular kind of model, very evocative. Dolly 2 does another one. I'm sure Dolly 3 will do something different yet again. And Midjourney does something yet again. They're all different stylistic things. The same prompt creates very different images. What's your mental model of that? How is it that the same prompt will do very, very different things? And what's more, will do very different things even on the same model. This is a fascinating question for us as HCI people. Now, let's combine this idea of image synthesis with the stylistic measure, method we've talked about before. You could take a statue like this and feed it into the image journey and say, oh, by the way, apply this particular jellyfish prompt. That's what the image is on the right. That's a famous drawing by Ernst Henkel of a bunch of jellyfish. If you take those two and merge them together, what do you get? Question for you, as a user, what do you expect? The answer is you get this interesting cartoonish bust with jellyfish wrapped around the neck. That's not an implausible image. It's extraordinary, but it's not implausible. If you applied, if I said to you as a human, draw me the statue with this style, you might have done that. Of course, notice that the statue is rotated 90, 180 degrees or 90 degrees or something. And it's cartoonish as opposed to the one on the left, which is a marble. And the jellyfish are sort of extraordinary. How do you know what you're going to get? Or are we all reduced to test and iterate? So the debate here is a long running debate. This reminds me a lot of when photography was introduced in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Would photography devalue human art? Long discussion, a famous book by Mulholly Nage about the relationship between painting, photography, and film. So the debate ultimately resolved in photography is a kind of art. It's not the same as classical painting, oil, watercolor, whatever. It's a new kind of art. I rather suspect we're going to see the same thing happen here. All of a sudden, photography was seen to be too simple, too truthful, but we discovered obviously with time that's not quite the case. There's great skill. There can be great skill in doing photography and great nuance and artistic value in creating beautiful photographs. We will see the same thing with respect to image generation. This becomes particularly interesting when you can't tell where the frame starts or the frame stops. Question, was the frame part of the prompt or not? Framing is importantly critical in photography. What's gonna be the key element in synthetic art? Because, you know, there's a lot going on here. These prompts can generate remarkably interesting images. The cute corgi living in a house made of sushi kills me every time I see it. But it's no less extraordinary than the other ones. These are all guided by text prompts given to Imogen, the system from Google. And, you know, you can get sort of equivalent kinds of images from other systems. What do you do as a user? Do you need to know the space of all possible systems or do you specialize in a particular tool? And what transfers from one tool to another? Does this prompt working here? Will that produce the same output over there? I will tell you now, no, it won't. What does it mean then to be designing the user interface for tools like this? If you ask a particular system to generate you an image with this prompt, Corella Village, Sharp Focus, Wide Shot, et cetera, et cetera, how can you modify this? Fundamental to a lot of human computer interaction is knowing how to change the behavior of the system. Knowing that if I wanted to rotate that building by 90 degrees, I would change my prompt like this. I can't tell you what that is. We are in a time of great uncertainty in the user experience and design of such systems. So one thing that's worth noticing is that these are all synthetic systems and some of them can do images with credible resolution and high verisimilitude. That is, they really look real. This website, one, this person does not exist. 
is a well-known site that generates completely fictitious fakes, faces. So this child, as attractive as that kid is, is not a real person. You can see where this is going, right? People push on these boundaries and synthetic systems like this, because they're out available, people can expect them and check them out. They tend to be replicated very quickly. So there are now dozens and dozens of these kinds of things. Deep fakes are part of the new tradition that we're having to live with. Another part of the mechanisms underlying these kinds of image synthesis systems is this notion of in-painting and out-painting. To first order, it's basically taking the kernel of this painting, of this well-known Vermeer painting, and then extrapolating outwards. This notion called out-painting, or in-painting when you're going towards the middle, is extraordinary because it allows you to hallucinate or fabricate or simply make up all the stuff that goes around the outside. So none of this actually was there. And there was no command given to it other than imagine what's around the periphery of the girl with the pearl earring. Even though, notice on the far left of that image, it starts to look more Thomas Benton Hardish. Nevertheless, this is an interesting user experience trope that we're starting to see more and more of, the continuation idea. Starting with one stimulus and then seeing what comes next. We're going to see this multiple times. Here's that same idea in another domain. Here is a music score for a system called Cococo. And what it does is on the left of that line that says B was the input music. On the right is the music that will then be generated. On the far right with numbers C, D, E, and F are pieces of advice or ways to view what the UI is telling you. I like this as an example because it starts to expose the ways in which different parameters of the system are exposed to the person, to the human, so that they can manipulate and guide the control of the system. So in this case, upper right corner gives you three sliders and a little bit of guidance. So you can make it more surprising and more conventional. So it's the guiding of the extension, guiding of the continuation of the outpainting, except in this case in, in sound space. Another nice idea here is on the bottom right, you see, let me audition a few alternatives. Those three boxes there show you the visualization of how the music will go when it is continued. So let's turn our attention. <clears throat> Let's turn our attention to the notion of creativity in these systems. One of the key things about being creative is that you create, you generate, you, you make. And yet, many people are blocked in their creativity by this terror of the blank page, the terror of the blank score, the terror of the blank canvas. One of the beautiful things about the new text generation systems is this ability to shift that out of a shackle that's on your pen to something that you can control and ideate with. So for example, with chat GPT, you can say, hey, brains, I don't know what to write. Brainstorm some ideas about combining VR and fitness. Just made that up. And it will generate some ideas for you. Hopefully this will prompt your creative juices to start flowing so that you can start making up, creating new kinds of content. So rather than viewing this as a as a uh, source of infinite plagiarism. I can see this as a way of getting people to move to start creating their own ideas, prompted by this set of uh, great creations right here. Now, it's interesting to note that inside, under the covers of that user interface, it, it, this is what's happening. What's fascinating to me about this is, I don't need to teach you the code, but see this model? text da Vinci 003, every system has implied within it, often explicit like this, an implied model that has been built that it's running against. So the prompt itself is brainstorm some ideas. And there's also this mysterious parameter temperature and another one, max tokens and top P. And you could probably go look those up. And so we have these different parameters that need to be understood in some way. So a big question for us is going to be, what do we expose to the user? Lots of options. What's important? What matters? 
if we take these ideas forward, the continuation idea, the image synthesis idea, one of the things you can do is not only import styles, but you can also import sort of seed images. So here we have a drawing of a horse and you can import this into the stability AI system and then say, give it another prompt to create a beautiful line drawing of a horse like this. Now you can see there's not a whole bunch of connection between those two other than that the horse is facing to the right. But you see the idea where this is going. You can use sketches input, that is static sketches that you photograph and you can then say transform into a more realistic rendering or even into a photorealistic version of what that original sketch is. Now, because of the imprecision of the text generated UI, this may or may not be exactly what you want, but you can now start to think this as an exploration tool, a creativity enhancing tool that transforms original art into more polished and completed art. So of course what happens in this is because a lot of the images have been crawled off of the web, you run into copyright issues or fair use issues or infringement issues, all of the above, some version of them. Here's a case in point. So Holly Mengert does illustrations, as you can see, for Disney. And on the right-hand side are those images that she did originally. Now, if you do a prompt and say her name, for example, in the illustration of Princess in the Forest, Holly Mangert's art style, you will get images like this. The four on the right are synthetic, not originals. You can see why she might be upset about this. This is part of what is in the code base, in the model of the Stable Diffusion Dream Booth system. So a bigger question is going to be, how do we deal with these issues? How do we deal with copyright in general? There are big players who might have vested interests involved here. So let's take this one step farther. Not only can we synthesize images and synthesize music by extrapolation, but we can also infer 3D models with a very similar idea. So on the far left, you see that cluster of four cute dog images. By looking at those kinds of images and doing model extrapolation, you can say, well, a dog typically looks like this. It's got these kinds of three-dimensional figures. And you can generate a 3D model, which you can then place in front of the Acropolis or go swimming or sleeping or getting a haircut. These are now malleable objects that the system has inferred from the simple pictures of the 2D uh, rendering of the animal. Now I want to mention another system because it shows an interesting illustration of how these ideas can be carried forward. Lexica is a company that synthesizes images like this in response to a prompt like that. What they do that's different is rather than generating these images on the fly in real time in response to the prompt that I have typed in, again, using artist names, it actually synthesizes these ahead of time in anticipation. These are images on spec, if you will. They're hoping that someone will come along and say, well, that looks really great. I'm going to get that from you. So this is an interesting approach. And I bring it up because it's a different way of thinking about user experience. This is code of the pre-computed response to a query, which is a fascinating approach. I don't know if this is going to work out long term, but it's a great way to create a bunch of images right now and have them handy and very fast to serve up. Of course, you knew this was coming. Obviously, videos can be captured and created as well in response to text, text prompts. So these are all, in some sense, obvious text prompts, like in the bottom right corner, a cat eating dinner in the style of Van Gogh, or a teddy bear skipping through Times Square, or whatever. These are all extrapolations of that same process. So let your mind go forward one more step. What happens after these sort of set shot video placements? Yeah. Adam, it, what happens is videos that are prompted by effectively what are scripts. So what you see here on the left is a script that was written as a prompt for a video generation system. The first one, first person view of a riding motorcycle through a busy street, then busy road in the woods. I'm going to start the video here. And you will see 
But the image quality is not great, but image quality in the first versions of the image synthesis systems were about this good as well. <clears throat> you can see where this is going. So soon we will be able to have videos that are following scripts that are generated by people. This is a new tool for creating videos, films, and so on. And of course, you knew deep fakes were going to come into this at some point. No, the Pope did not wear a white puffy Balenciaga jacket. But there are people who believe he does. Now, you can imagine what the issue is here. Copyright, deep fakes, where is this going? I think one of the interesting things that I've seen recently is the ability to synthesize videos of avatars. Now, in this case, it's a company called Synesthesia that creates avatars like the actor you see here. You then type in your script, in this case, the intent is for training videos, and you then say, say this, these words in this video setting. And you can select multiple different kinds of avatars. Actors over on the right-hand side show up in a palette. And so the interface here is interesting. It's very straightforward. This is not necessarily an AI user interface. It's a very conventional user interface that just happens to have a deep, heavy, interesting AI system in the back end. So once you do this, you end up with these lovely videos. Welcome to your new hire onboarding. I'm Alicia, and I'm excited to give you a quick introduction to Tableau and show you how to access your dashboards. The point here is that Alicia never said those words. That was very clip, clever lip animation. It's called lip flap animation, where you synchronize the motion of the mouth with the sounds of the text as it's being synthesized by a text-to-speech synthesizer. So this is very, very convincing. And if you're looking to push the social button, this is a great way to do it. Here's an interesting thought, though. Where is this going? These are not quite deep fakes, but they're extremely good fakes that are scriptable. And if you can imagine connecting this up to a chat bot, what would that mean? Where is this going? Where would we like it to go? I want to bring up an important concept. If you can generate an arbitrary amount of time of our avatars speaking whatever they're scripted to say, an arbitrary amount of text through text generation systems, an arbitrary number of images through image synthesis systems, and an arbitrary amount of music done in a particular style, that creates what's called a Bach faucet. That is, you turn the faucet on and you get essentially an arbitrary amount of Bach. Here's what I mean. If you click on this Bach Chorale Generation button, here's what you get. None of that is actual Bach. It's interesting to know. This is basically an algorithmic generation that will give you a thousand hours, 10,000 hours. It can give you Bach until you die, basically. So what's a text faucet like that generates an arbitrary number of books? Imagine one that generates a thousand romance novels a day. What will that do to the romance novel market or detectives or Swedish detective subgenre fiction? See my point. From our perspective, we have to think as HCI people, how are we going to guide these systems? What's the interaction? that we need to do, we need to build in order to go from our idea to this working finished product. <clears throat> An important thing for us to notice is this idea of continuation is a key thing, that this idea of painting and painting in all media types, sound, images, video, all of that. All of this works you know, across these different media kinds. So what happens when we merge all this together? Text generation, avatars, video generation, speech recognition, text to speech creates what exactly? It creates a very complex system where it's not just the single user interface design. The problems of Kai in the past, like 
how quickly can you move a mouse through a gate on a screen or sort of they're beyond us now right now we need to figure out how we can give clever guidance to these deep complex systems that may or may not do exactly what we want we've moved more into the realm of being warlocks and witches and wizards and casting spells that we hope have the right effect so open issues there are a lot but i want to key point some of these how can we keep control of the ai systems we build it's one thing to give a text prompt it's another thing to make it do exactly what you're hoping to do so this fine-grained control that we've expected from our systems in the past may not be what we have going forward is there a way to recapture it if so what are those ui idioms just as importantly how can i the user understand what the ai system is doing what's my mental model what should it be is it just magic if it's just magic there's got to be a better way to communicate this what would that be like in other lectures in this course you've heard about explainability you've heard about the ability to develop ai systems so what's the communication protocol how can we go from desire to actually getting the thing done that we want in essence what i'm trying to do as a user of these systems is to co-create with them they're now powerful enough that it's not just drawing a line and making a bezier curve to do that it's all of a sudden describing a much more complicated scene a much more complicated set of things that i'm looking for what's the right language for that and of course as we mentioned how does copyright change in a world like this if we've got bach faucets for an infinite number of images that are done in the style of leonardo da vinci what does that do it probably isn't going to damage his profit margin but for more contemporary illustrators what happens what should we, we be doing I want to leave you with that thought because there's a huge amount of research issues here. I don't even know the answers to most of these questions. The world has changed a lot just in the past year. By Kai 2024, an entirely new set of issues will come up. I hope to see you there, and I'll definitely see you in Hamburg at the, at the in-person courses.